morning, church. If you have a Bible, turn to uh, Mark's Gospel, chapter 12. We're back into it after a week away. Mark, chapter 12, starting in verse 13. When we uh, get together to try to formulate where we are in the preaching calendar and specifically which portion of the scripture we're going to deal with, we're not particularly that creative with titles, okay? Not that it really matters. I'm not a big fan of that stuff necessarily. So we just pick like a phrase out of the text and say, well, that, there you go, there's the title. But, but sometimes maybe better handlebars will help you leave with it. So I've given it my own title. It won't show up on the website, but it's what you're going to hear today. And that is Lessons on Ownership is kind of how I'm, I'm putting this. Because Jesus confronts us, or we are confronted by Jesus' instructions to a question regarding paying taxes. Sounds like fun, doesn't it? Yeah, so, so anyway, we're going to talk about that specifically. There's a question that the Pharisees posed to Jesus, and it wasn't a real question. It was illegitimate because it was only intended to trap Jesus because there's an agenda going on, and that is to get rid of him. But in Jesus' answer, there is depth and implication and application to how we live and how we submit to God's rule in our life. And so... Um, it has a lot of weight to it. There are some scholars, many Bible scholars, that kind of put this kind of sentence behind this text that is perhaps the single most influential political statement ever made. Now, I don't know if that's true, but it's pretty, pretty weighty what he says. And specifically, if we look at our world that we live in, and we're coming up to an election, um, if, if you think it's gone to hell in a handbasket, well, then this is going to be for you, okay? Packed in these five verses... Uh, Jesus deals with the rule of government, or the role of government. He, he deals with the role of citizenship. He deals with the authority of God and the rule of God in our life, and he calls us to repentance and obedience. So heavy duty, and we got a lot of work to do in front of us. So before we read the text and pray, I, I'd like to back up and get context so you understand what's happening here. Again, this is Jesus' last week of his life. It's Tuesday or Wednesday, Friday, he's going to the cross and, and to be killed and murdered as an innocent man. And it's not as if Jesus hasn't experienced tension before in his three years of public ministry. Clearly he has, and, and we've seen that through our study of Mark. But we are in a section now where all the tension is getting super intense, and, and it's becoming uh, clear the focus of what's going on unto the point of death for Jesus. And so these are his last days. And if we back up to chapter 11, you have to look there, but Jesus is kind of um, entered into Jerusalem on a donkey with the crowds cheering, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. If you're a religious leader and you think you know what it is to follow God and what it is to, to be one of God's, for Jesus to get that kind of publicity at that moment was tremendously infuriating for them. And so they were plotting at that point. Jesus, first thing he does is enter into the temple and starts cleaning house. He throws over tables and he accuses the, uh, the people of perverting worship. We saw in chapter 12 as well, um, Jesus tells a parable. And the parable was pretty clear, so clear that the Pharisees go, he's talking about us. And the parable was about this vineyard owner who has tenants who are running a vineyard. And every once in a while, the owner would send representatives or servants to check up on the, on the vineyard. Now, the story is this. God is over his people, Israel. And God would send prophets and priests to the people, and they would always reject what God was doing. And they would put them away or kill them or whatever. So in this story, the owner sends his son, who we know is Jesus. And they kill him too. And so the father, the owner, deals with that. He destroys the tenants, and he gives the vineyards to others. Now, that's the story, and it was so clear um, to the Pharisees at the moment. They go, he's talking about us. And so there's a couple of little responses they had to the cleaning of the temple and the, the telling of the parable. Is One, they were immediately seeking to destroy him or to arrest him. We see that in the text, okay? And it's all over this issue that's common to man. Jealousy, fear, and insecurity. It kind of hangs in, the, in kind of the core of, of who we are as natural man. I'm worried about them. I'm worried about me. I'm worried about things. And I can't even see the sun because of it. And so in this section we're going to look at today, 
it begins the plan to bring Jesus to a conclusion, okay? And it, and it happens in a series of confrontations that we deal with here that begin at 13 and we'll deal with the next couple of weeks that are designed, one, to discredit Jesus in front of the people. Like if we show him for who we think he is, then all of these folks will stop following him and hosanna in him. And, and so that's what we want to do. Or they'll have a reason to accuse him before the state. Either one of those things is good fuel for fire if we're going to try to get rid of Jesus. Make sense? So that's where we are in context. Here comes the real, real energetic pursuit of Jesus' destruction in, in verse 13. Let's read it together, five verses, and then I'll uh, pray, and, and we'll ask for the Spirit's help here. Verse 13, and they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they came and said to him, teacher, we know that you are true and, and do not care about anyone's opinion. For you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one. And he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, render to Caesar the thing that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Let's pray. God, I pray right now for um, divine help. For my heart, for my lips, for these people's hearts and ears to hear. God, I pray for protection, not to say something you haven't said, but clearly to press into the things you want to say. And so I pray for that help. I pray for our ears. I pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, if you're one of those who likes outlines and you like to write notes, and I'm, this is a perfect day because I have taken these five verses and just simply uh, dissected it into five observations, okay? Five observations that are going on. Here's the five. I'll give them to you in advance. One is the observation of the conspirators. The second is the observation of the setup. Third observation is of the perfect question, fourth is the divine answer, and fifth is the lessons learned. That's, that's what we're going to look at today. Let's look, first of all, at the conspirators in verse 13. Out of nowhere, it just says, and they. And I don't know if you like to ask questions of the text, but you should stop at they and go, who are they? Like, who is they sending the Pharisees? Who are they sending the Herodians? Well, let me describe to you who this is. This is the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin is the leadership council for for Israel. It's made up of three particular groups. Um, It's 70 leaders plus the high priest, 70 plus one, they would say, and it's made of three groups. One is the Pharisees, and we're familiar with the Pharisees. We've talked a lot about them in in our study in, in Mark, but Pharisees were considered the spiritual fathers of Judaism, okay? They taught and they believed, um... The, the law that God gave Moses called the Torah, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis to Deuteronomy, that's what they believed in. And they also believed that God gave something to Moses in addition to the Torah. He gave them the kind of the oral law. In other words, the interpretation of all these particular statements of God, all the hundreds and hundreds of laws, the Pharisees would come and carry around and put it on people and place it on people. And they would write new ones because God said that to Moses. And they would place it like that. They would say that these are what we believe in and this is what God's given Moses. Pharisees also believed in the afterlife. The super afterlife. They believed in the supernatural. That God rewards the righteous and he destroys the, the wicked. They believed in a Messiah to come, that there was a Redeemer coming to rescue the world and bring peace to everyone. That's what they believed in, okay? That's the first group that made up the Sanhedrin. The second group was the Sadducees. And the Sadducees were kind of an elitist group who were very liberal in their lifestyle because they they believed in the, the Torah, okay, the five books. It's the only thing they'd adhere to. Everything else, like how you lived that out, they rejected. They rejected the oral commands. Everything the Pharisees would say, they go, not for us. And so they were very influenced by the culture, um, and they didn't live up to the, those things, okay? And they didn't believe in the afterlife or the supernatural or the Messiah. They just, just shut that all off, okay? The third group that are part of this leadership council called the Sanhedrin is the scribes. They show up from time to time in our text, too. And if you just want to picture a scribe, just think pre-rabbi teacher, 
They haven't yet qualified for the distinction of rabbi, but they're clearly teaching and influencing many, and they're invited to the table of leadership. And so that, that group, as well as the Sadducees, as well as the Pharisees, make up the Sanhedrin, and that is the they in verse 13, okay? Um, and the text simply says that, that that group sends some of the Pharisees and also out of nowhere, it says some of the Herodians to question Jesus. Now, to us, it doesn't sound like any big deal. Just another group of people I don't understand and, and don't really care to. But I want you to realize who the Herodians are, and you're going to see how odd this pairing is. The Herodians were kind of a, Jelu- a Jewish political party. Is really their, their role. And they were government sympathizers, they loved Herod's rule, and they participated in kind of the social customs that Rome introduced. Clearly, they stood out in in that environment to the Pharisees. These people couldn't have anything less to do with each other, okay? And how they saw life and how they saw faith and how they saw religion. The Pharisees were most religious. The Herodians were most irreligious. Do you understand? Um, The the Pharisees were devoted to Israel, and the Herodians were devoted to Caesar. So you have intense religion and intense political perspectives. These two groups should not be together, but they are. And uh, here's why they joined arms in this particular situation. Simply because their hatred corporately together regarding Jesus was greater than their hatred for each other. Both of them saw Jesus as a threat. Not not just to faith and God and what I understand and truth and what's right, but power and authority. Jesus spoke as one that never spoke before, and it threatened the Herodians and it threatened the Pharisees. And so there's a contingency of men who go now to trap Jesus. There, There is something else that will explain why the Pharisees were willing to join arms with the Herodians, and that is the Pharisees needed them. Because... The Pharisees clearly hated Jesus, but they hated him over his theology, right? They hated him over what he said about God and himself and what it was to obey. Rome couldn't care less about theology. If you, if, if you were going to kill Jesus, you had to convince Rome that he was somehow a political threat, like something he said would undermine their control. And so they joined arms to try to attack both angles, and so that's why the Herodians are there. And that's where this whole story is headed, okay, to bring accusations regarding what Jesus thought about taxes, which, which clearly kind of amount to uh, insurrection. So that is, that is the first observation, the conspirators. That's who's in this story. But let's look now at the second observation, the setup in verse 14, okay? Again, here's what it says. And they came to him and said to him, now I'm going to read this with as much sass as I possibly can because that's how it's supposed to read teacher, we know. We know that you are true and you don't care about anybody's opinion. For you are not swayed by appearances and, and but truly teach the way of God only. Uh. <laughs> so that was their heart. I mean, it was, it was totally to totally twist the situation. I, I, let me just read to you a, Mark, a Luke's account as well. I think they'll put it up on the screen, but it adds a few little nuances to it. Here's what Luke says in Luke chapter 20. The the scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour. And I was talking about when he shared that parable and they realized it was them. For they perceived that he had told this against them and they feared the people. Verse 20. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be sincere that they might catch him in something he said so as to deliver him up to authority and jurisdiction to the governor. Okay? Okay. The point of both of these narratives is that they were out to get Jesus. The text says to, to trap him. It's the only time in all of Scripture that that word trapped is, is used in the text at all. And it means to violently pursue. The agenda is really, really clear what the Pharisees and Herodians have in mind was to bring harm to him. Now, their intention, according to the text, was to bring this violent harm. That's the word that Mark uses. But... The setup wasn't so violent looking, was it? I mean, it was more to butter up than to bring harm, wasn't it? Just kind of flattery. What was the point of all all of that? Now, if you read this as sappy as I think it was kind of heard by Jesus' ears, these guys couldn't know less about their opponent. They couldn't know less. 
One is they probably thought, or maybe they considered that he's dumb enough not to read through those intentions. Like these guys have been nothing but on my heels trying to ruin my ministry my whole three years, and now they think I'm good? I see through that. Or they thought that Jesus was needy enough to even want what they were selling. Like this feels good to hear that. So they didn't know Jesus at all. But what they were doing was really clear. Let's compliment him. Maybe he'll lower his guard. Maybe we'll set this trap with this question. Maybe he'll answer it. However he answers it, we win. Because he won't be thinking. We've tricked him with these kind words, okay? Now, before we move on, let me make a point. Um, and and to, to point out some seriously deep irony in this whole thing. Everything that was said about Jesus here by these men was true but they didn't believe a word of it. Isn't that unbelievable? Like, you could take that phrase and say, that's my Jesus, and be absolutely right and true. They did not say it, believing that it was true. They'd never met anybody like Jesus. They never knew anybody who was, who was uninfluenced and insecure and fragile. They never knew one like, in fact, they were looking probably at themselves in the mirror and go, that's our issue too. Fear of the people, fear of the people. Keeps showing up in the text. That's what these leaders dealt with. They didn't believe what Jesus taught at all, even though that's what they said. In fact, if you go back to the beginning of Mark, when the Pharisees confronted Jesus, they accused him of casting out demons by the name of Beelzebub, Satan. They they were not confused at all what they think Jesus did and how he did it. He's from the evil one. So they're lying through their teeth when they're making these statements because they think if they just look like they've come along and they're where Jesus wants them to be, then this question will be perceived as a reasonable question that just deserves a reasonable answer. Does that make sense? No threat whatsoever, okay? Now, before I move on, let me just make a point. All throughout the Gospels, we see the picture of Christ. And there's a narrative to our church experience where we say, be like Jesus, right? Or, Or when we're being transformed and when we're being discipled, we're being conformed into whose image? Christ's image, right? I think the church could stop and make a note about this statement about Jesus and say, God, do that in us too. Because there's this flesh kind of natural man thing hanging around still in us as Christians that is terrified of other people who would prefer to prop up an image of us that isn't true of us because what if people got close enough to see who I really am? And some of us walk around totally crippled by the fear of others or being swayed by people's affections for you, where Jesus simply believes the truth and he loves people selflessly. And he's not interested in how that turns out necessarily in their opinions of him. I think the church could use a dose of that, right? Would you agree? Okay, for what it's worth, there you go, side point, free point in the sermon. There you go. Um, Let's get back to task here. Here's the third observation in the text. The perfect question, second half of verse 14. Simple question, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? Now, all this flattery was given to lower the guard of Jesus so that he'd just be set up for it. And the question they asked was the essence of a no-win question. We have some of those. If someone's ever asked you, have you stopped overeating? That's that kind of question. Yes? No? What do I say? I'm a fat pig. I give up. That's what you say. Okay. In the Pharisee's mind, it doesn't matter which way Jesus answers it, we've got him. Because if Jesus said that they shouldn't pay taxes, well, the people will love him, but he'll be clearly in the crosshairs of Rome, won't he? Because in essence, as popular as Jesus is and the the way people are influenced by him, that statement alone would be equivalent to insurrection and encouraging a rebellion against Rome, wouldn't it? Now, if Jesus said that they should pay their taxes, well, Rome would applaud him, but suddenly now he would lose platform with the people. The trust of the people would go away. And the Pharisees would lean into that, and they would say, and by the way, their insecurity was bothered by their their people following Jesus. He's not like us. And clearly, they couldn't bring him down from that simple questions. They would find success. Perfect, perfect trap question, so they thought. And that takes us to the fourth observation. The divine answer, verses uh, 15 through 17. But knowing their hypocrisy, 
he said to them, why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one and he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, well then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. First thing Jesus does is ask for a coin, a denarius, a little silver coin, nothing very special, possibly the, kind of the, the amount of a day's wage. But it was, it was a denarius that was used to pay a tax, a poll tax, a census tax. And a census was simply a tax you paid for being alive. Everyone paid it. No reason, no use, no overhead, just you're here, you're breathing, here you go. Here's a tax. That's what Rome would do for you, all right? On one side of the coin, it had Caesar Tiberius' face on it. On the other side, it would have his mother, believe it or not, and an inscription that said high priest, okay? It's interesting to note that in Luke's narrative of the same story, he doesn't use singular tax like Mark does. He uses a plural word for taxes, so in essence, if we were to rewrite what the question is, it wasn't like, I'm, I'm bothered by this census tax, Jesus. This denarius is too much for us. In essence, what they're saying is, why do we have to pay any of these things to Rome? Why do we pay taxes? Should we pay taxes to this pagan government is, is in essence, the question. Now, it is fascinating um, to look at the polar positions of the people asking the question. Remember Pharisees and the Herodians? They're the ones asking the question. Well, here's the Herodians' position on taxes. They didn't mind it at all. If you want to kind of split your understanding to what's happening here, just take something like happens in good old US of A, whether it be something so like extreme possibly as a real strong liberal position or a real strong conservative position, whatever, doesn't really matter to me, but that's sort of what's happening here. The Herodians didn't mind taxes because they liked the benefits that, the, that Rome would bring to them because of the taxes, all right? Loved it, loved all the bennies. They believed that the state was superior to religion anyway, so paying taxes to Caesar was no big deal. Pharisees, on the other hand, hated it. Hated everything to do with paying any money to Rome for a couple of reasons. And that was because even that coin, even that coin was hard to own because there was an image on it. It was Caesar's image, and they believed that they were not to handle anything with a graven image on it, and especially some guy who thought he was a god. They would have a hard time even carrying it in their pocket. It's strange that in this situation they had one, but nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless, they were bothered by this whole kind of wickedness of this, of this Caesar They also had this fundamental belief that the state was subject to religious rule. In other words, they thought they should be in charge. Anything else was infringing on God's right and God's rule, and they could not see it any other way. The Herodians loved that because it it produced all sorts of social benefits, and the Pharisees said, we hate that because clearly this isn't our way, it's not God's way, and it undermines God, and so there's two different positions. So, but Jesus' answer is so perfect. Like all of his answers to questions are. And so precise when he deals with the heart of the issue. And and by the way, that's all that Jesus ever does. Jesus goes after the heart and the intentions and the motive and the will of every question. We're looking for laws and rules. Natural man wants, do I pay the tax or not? And Jesus goes after the idols of the heart. That's what he does. And he does it in this situation too. That's why it's a perfect answer. A profound answer. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Now, to us, it sounds like a setup to the second half, which sounds like a better answer, okay? But to them, I think something started to ring in their ears because they had a belief at the time that, that coins were the property of whoever's image or inscription was on them. That's what they believed. So in essence, he's asking, why do you have a problem giving Caesar his possessions? Like, it doesn't make any sense. Pretty simple answer, but I think profound at some level, because I don't think they anticipated he would just say that. But there is so much more depth in his answer. And this is where we get that last observation. It's like lessons learned, or what is Jesus teaching here? And I think this is where they marveled. Not, not only this simple answer that this is Caesar's possession, you should just give it back to him. But when he brings up God, it changes everything. I think that's where the marvel comes from. And let me just unpack a few of these things, and I think there's probably more than just the few that I've mentioned, but nevertheless, let me give them to you. 
I think Jesus' answer here acknowledges the legitimacy of human government. They never saw that coming. To a Pharisee, he's saying, this isn't right. It's not good. We shouldn't pay the taxes. Jesus simply says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And by one simple response, he legitimizes what their biggest frustration was, that there is a place and a time for leadership, even, even if it's crazy leadership that thinks they're God. He could have at that point in time said, okay, I get it. Don't pay taxes to this guy. Wait for a better king. Wait for a righteous king. He doesn't say that, does he? I think the point that, that can be made here is even a poorly run government is better than no government at all. And, and that's all over the scriptures, by the way. The Apostle Paul, if you remember when we studied Romans uh, way back when, but I'm going to read it to you anyway, when he's talking about submission or subjection to authorities, he brings up this issue of government, and he says this in chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. It's clear what Paul says. It's clear what Jesus is saying here. Now, let me stop and uh, just recognize the obvious. There's complexity to that statement, isn't there? Because if you're a thinking man or woman, you're asking the exception rules. I mean, just blind obedience, just go, go with it. I don't, I don't think that's what the text implies here. There are limits to authority. If we just simply use the, the sentence that Jesus uses to answer the question, there are limits to that authority. Let me... Let me give you some of them. Here's, here's one limit to the governing authorities. When we're asked to violate a command of God. Does that make sense? For, for instance, now it's not like you couldn't just sit here right now and go through a thousand that you see locally, but let me give you biblical examples of when you go against authority. When the apostles were preaching the name of Jesus, the gospel of God in Jesus' name, they were arrested. And they were told by the authorities, stop it. Stop talking about Jesus. And what did they say? I got to obey God. And they were released from prison and went right back out and started preaching in whose name? Jesus' name, right? Let me take you to Old Testament. In Daniel chapter 3, there's three amigos, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Nebuchadnezzar had this ego issue, and he thought that he was God or like a God, and he said, bow down and worship me. They said, we're not doing it, okay? And so what does he do? He throws them in the fiery furnace. Side note, when you obey... Sometimes you have to obey under consequence. I'm not saying we're there, but it's a possibility, right? They're not making fiery furnaces right now that I know of, but clearly in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's world, the decision included a decision to die. Another example from Daniel, Daniel chapter 6, Daniel himself, Nebuchadnezzar said, you need to pray to me. Everyone can't pray to anything else but pray to me. Daniel ignored that, went up to his room, opened the windows, bowed down and prayed to God. And Nebuchadnezzar did what with him? Lions then. Okay, that's the reality of this. If, if, if there is a time, and I think the point is pretty simple, if the government, our rulers, ever forbid us to do something God commands or commands us to do something God forbids, then you have an obligation based on your faith to disobey. Does that make sense? This isn't political. This is Bible, okay? So smile. All right. There's another, um, I think, resistance that uh, I think we have an obligation to, and, and that is simply this, that when we're asked to do something immoral or unethical. Now, herein lies the nuance of understanding what God cares about. There are many things that we deal with today that the Bible says nothing about, right? Things that we've invented, crazy stuff that I'm certain that if Jesus was walking the planet now would end up somewhere in here as examples of sin and failure, right? Nevertheless, they're not explicit, but they're clearly wrong and immoral. You list them in your head, okay? I don't have to tell you that our world is changing, do I? And it's not getting better. Now, I'm not doing naysayer thing. I, here, here's the reality. I have one son, Jesse, who almost every night watches Andy Griffith before he goes to bed. <laughs> Coping mechanism, right? It's the way to push back against the world, right? But there is this, like, fictitious dream out there that there was a day not long ago that America was so much more holy. And I don't believe that. I think we were more moral 
but holy, set apart unto God? I don't think so. But I, there is something that's happening in our day and age, and that is this. I, I would call it the Romans 1 slide. Um, when a culture gets to the place of not going to the darkness to hide your evil, but coming out in the light and calling it good, that's a Ro- Romans 1 slide. It's another step of depravity. Clearly, we're there. Clearly, there's a thousand things that people are putting up. There. No, this is good, and you're bad for thinking it's bad, and we're going to judge you for that. And I'm not, I'm not going to talk specifically about what those are, but it's all over us, right? When a society gets to the place of saying this bad thing is good and you need to accept it, then I think there's an obligation, a gospel obligation to not give in and say ethically and morally it's not right. It's not right. So, uh, just as a side note, um, I'm not really politically driven much. I mean, I, I vote and I understand the issues and I vote my conscience, but as far as getting really wrapped up in all of this stuff, I don't do it and I, I hope you don't judge me too much. This is the fear of man probably talking, but, um, but I want you to know as a leadership team, not just as elders of Gilbert, but also redemption, we have conversations about all these changes and how they're going to affect the church. Like what happens when our government comes after us? When they say you need to do this or not do that or think this or not think that or else, and, and I want you to know we've had enough conversation to say that we're not going to compromise. And it might mean, it, it might mean that, that we can't formally organize under the banner of a thing called Redemption Church. We might have to get rid of a building or pastors get jobs, but we, we can do church like Acts, couldn't we? We can meet homes. Nothing can stop the kingdom of God, nothing, right? And so I just want you to know we have those conversations that when the world wants to change the narrative and call sin good, it's going to someday mean something. I'm kind of praying that I retire by then, but, <laughs> um, but I'm prepared either, either way. The point that Jesus makes, render unto Caesar. The point that Paul makes in, in Romans chapter 12 to submit yourselves to governing authorities. The point that Peter makes in 1 Peter 2 when he says, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, to the emperor, to governors, honor the emperor. You know who the emperor was when Paul and Peter were preaching these words, don't you? It was Nero. This is the guy that accused the Christians for all sorts of bad things. This is a guy that put the church on fire, literally, it would impale them and light his gardens with them. This is Peter and Paul saying, okay, even if they're crazy, I want you to be subjected. This is intense. And of all the ways that God could have said to us, the church, to line up under things, for Paul to write that, Peter to write that in that moment, in that day, for, for Jesus to say these things when Caesar Tiberius was running the things, when Pontius Pilate and Felix was going to throw him in jail for nothing, clearly this is talking about the extremes, isn't it? And so I think there's a a, a tendency in us to get so angry with the way things are going to to justify sin, which would be rebellion. So let me, um, I wrote down something that may be helpful. I called it the four P's of godly citizenship. Clever, right? (laughs) There's more to being a godly citizen than maybe these four P's, but you'll remember these. I think you have an obligation biblically to do these. Pay your taxes. Do not cheat. If there's any obvious obvious application to this text. Jesus answers the question, render unto Caesar's, so pay your taxes. And sometimes, sometimes even Christians fudge. Obedience looks like paying your taxes. No cheat. Second P of godly citizenship, pay your respect. Pay your respect. That is the whole idea of honoring that Peter suggests or Paul suggests. Honor your authorities. Respect them. Number three, participate as a citizen. Vote, serve, and obey the law. Make sense? And the fourth one, pray. Pray for your leaders. The Bible tells us to do that. Faithfully pray for them. There is another lesson learned, I think, in this answer from Jesus. It's a powerful one, and it's this, that God is the sovereign ruler of the universe, and every leader is in position by his own hand. Okay? I want you to let that settle in on an election year, okay? I want that to settle in. The text tells us to render to God the things that are God. David tells us what those things are. In Psalm 24, he says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. 
What do we render to God? Everything in the world. Everything. Daniel 2, verse 21 says that he, God, changes times and season. He removes kings and he sets kings up. Okay? This is classically American Christian to freak out over who gets elected. Don't do it. Because it doesn't demonstrate that you believe God is sovereign. Vote, know the issues, care about stuff, get involved, do whatever you got to do. But when it's all said and done, relax. God is sovereign, amen? Okay. There is one last lesson, I think, that I'm going to mention today. In fact, there's another question in the text. Only thing is it's hidden. It's hidden in Jesus' answer. It is the most important question of the day. In fact, if I could flush everything I've said so far, this is the only thing we talk about. So that's how important I think this is. Here's the question. Whose image do you reflect? Whose image do you reflect? Jesus simply took a coin and said, whose image is on this? It's Caesar's. Okay, no sweat. Give it to him. And then he says, whose image is on you? And I suppose there's a question, and we could split it down two lines of thought. To those of us who call ourselves Christians, let me ask you this question. Do you give your life to God? Do you? Is it Sunday at 9.30? Or is it Tuesday afternoon? When do you give? Do you give your life to God, or is it conditional? I think that's what Jesus is talking about. Render unto God. Give to God the things that are God's. And you're claiming to be his child. You're claiming to be indwelt with the Holy Spirit. You're claiming to have a new focus and a new intention as your life in God's hands in all ways. If someone, if someone that didn't know you got involved in your life for a period of time, just got really close, went, went where you went, went on your vacations together was in your house and that place of work, driving around in the car with you, what would they say of you? Because that's a, probably a clear depiction of how close we are to living this thing out, living a life of God. Is your life known for obedience and repentance? Or is it known for something else? Now, let me just describe that because sometimes you hear the word obedience and suddenly, and this is the natural man talking again, starts creating lists of things to, to perform our way to, to feeling good about our relationship with God. I'm not meaning that. I do think the church obeys. But the preeminent, pre, preeminent expression of the church is repentance. Brokenness. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Here's what Christians do. Christians sin. We do but we call it sin, and we turn from that sin as many times as it takes, and we go the other way towards Christ, don't we? We fall down, we think wrong thoughts, we get angry, we care about them, we worry, we do all those things. Christians repent. Here's to the potential unbelievers in the room. And I'm not even certain sometimes how to describe this. Those of you who say in your life, I don't either, one, believe in spiritual things, or two, I do, but I don't believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior. I don't believe in the need for a Savior. However you want to define what it means to be an unbeliever, if, you, if you're in this room, I, I just want you to listen for just a second, okay? J- just a minute. Ignoring spiritual things and not trusting in Jesus Christ will never change the fact that you were made in the image of God, Ever. Therefore, here's what's always true about you. You were made by God, and there's a purpose to find joy in. You were made by God, and there's a satisfaction that's only found in one place. You were made by God and for God, and there's joy only one place. Peace and the freedom that you're hunting for in all the wrong locations is found only in Jesus Christ, who is God the Son. And here's what I'm trying to tell you. I know it's normal. I know it's normal to hunt for all those things, but it doesn't work. It's like using the wrong tool to fix a problem. I I have lots of tools in my garage. It's littered with, I love tools. I have a fixation with tools. I know how to use them. What drives me crazy to see somebody pounding a nail with a pliers 
I hate that. That's not what it's for. Use the hammer. And some of you use your life to bring satisfaction and joy, and that's not what it's for. You were made by God in the image of God to bring him glory. You're a reflector. That's what you are. And I'm telling you here, if you've put your whole life and all of your investments in trying to sort out those longings and those needs of which God put in you, and you're doing it the wrong way, I'm going to tell you to stop, run from that, it doesn't work, and pursue Jesus. And in Jesus alone is freedom and peace. Amen? Here's what I know. People who, who live their life without a clue of God make a mess of things, just like I did. Well, Jesus can take your mess and make it right. He covers you so completely, there is no more sin. He doesn't see it. You will not be judged. And you have the Holy Spirit inside of you that will totally wreck the old you and build a new you won't recognize. Do you believe that, church? Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the gospel. I thank you that every story, every narrative, every situation ends with Jesus. God, I do pray that we would ask the question, are we bearing the image of God? Are we reflecting his image in the way we behave and the way we talk and the way we trust? To those of us who are Christians, I suppose today we'll start with repentance. I do pray for those who might still be questioning whether you're real or whether Jesus offers what he offers. I pray that your Holy Spirit would do this hostile takeover. Seize them and drag them to yourself to believe and trust in Christ and know the freedom that he alone provides. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.